Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to ARA's webinar Wednesday. I am Sri Rao, your moderator for today's webinar titled Transitioning from Manual to Automated Distress Identification for the Florida Department of Transportation's Statewide Pavement Condition Survey. Now, I would like to introduce our presenter <coughs> and my colleague and friend, Mateo Carvajal. Uh, Mr. Carvajal joined the ARA team working on site at FDOT's State Material Office in January 2019. Uh, uh, Mateo was the activity coordinator for the statewide pavement acceptance and project performance program, where he was responsible for scheduling uh, speed, uh, profiler testing and reporting for the FDOT's newly constructed and on-service pavement. Uh, Mr. Carvajal has been the activity coordinator for the LTMS data analysis program since March 2020. Uh, he is proficient in the analysis and reporting of payment condition data and skills in the use of software tools. And you can see uh, the list out there. And he uh, has skills with ICC Connect, LTMS, Road Inspect, uh, WinRP, uh, VBA, Python, SQL, among several others. Um, since he joined ARA and the SMO team, he has developed numerous software applications that are used daily for data analysis, processing, and quality control. Uh, before coming to the U.S., uh, Mr. Carvajal worked in the Colombian MEPDG Mechanistic Empirical Payment Design Guide and the National Roads Institute, where he gained experience with non-destructive testing equipment, including FWD and GPR. So I would like to hand it over to Matteo. Matteo, thank you very much for today's presentation. Take it over. Thank you very much, Sri, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. As you may have noticed on the long title of my presentation, today we're going to be sharing some of the lessons learned and challenges faced during this transition period between the manual to the automated distress survey for the Florida Department of Transportation. And here is the outline of my presentation. I would like to start by briefly introducing the topic, and then we will get into the way that the DOT has been collecting and reporting their tracking data for the last 45 years using the windshield survey method. And then we will see an alternative provided by the data survey vehicles, also known as LCMS. And we will get into the core of this presentation, which is the estimation of the crack rating models. And because this is a still a work in progress, we are going to see what are the next steps in this process. So to introduce this topic, I would like to start talking about MAP21. Some of you may be already familiar with this legislation, but for those of you who are not, MAP21 stands for Moving Ahead for Progress in the 21st Century. This was a funding authorization bill that was passed in 2012 by President Obama. And among many others, its main objective was to reduce the crashes, injuries, and fatalities involving motor vehicles, and in a nutshell, to provide the U.S. drivers with the highest safety standards. So the way that the United States Department of Transportation envisioned doing that was by establishing minimum performance targets for pavements, and each state can decide to either adopt those minimum targets or tweak those numbers based on their historical data but each state must maintain the thresholds and reevaluate those targets every two years and come up with an improvement plan if they are below the standards. The map that I have presented on this slide represents the list of roadways that have to be reported to the Federal Highway Administration, FHWA, under the Highway Performance Monitoring System, or HPMS, and we refer to this network as the National Highway System. And this slide presents the current performance targets and values for the National Highway System payments in the state of Florida. As you can see on this table on the left, the first two rows presents the targets for the interstate network, while the last rows present the targets for the non-interstate payments. You can see a couple of columns. Like I said before, we have to reevaluate those targets every two years. So we have the two years and the four-year targets. And if you look at the numbers, you can notice that the department has decided to keep those values the same for the two-year and the four-year target, mainly because after is going through this transition period and they want to know more about this technology before changing the numbers. And second, because in addition to the roadways that I show you on the previous slide, the department has to report to the FHWA what they refer to as the off-system roadways. 
And these samples change every two years, so they represent a lot of variability in the system. Now, if we take a look at the numbers, we can see that the target for the interstate lane miles in good condition is 60%, and this is a minimum target. In other words, the department needs to guarantee that they have at least 60% of their interstate lane miles in good condition. Then we have the target for lane miles in poor condition, and this is at maximum thresholds. So the DOT cannot have more than 5% of interstate lane miles in poor condition. And if you take a look at the current values presented in this pie chart, you can see that the current values exceed or meet the standards. In this case, 72.2 is greater than that 60% target, and 0.5% is below the 5% target. And the same is true for the non-interstate pavements. 48.8% is above the 40% established target, and 1.2% which is the lane miles in poor condition, is below the 5% target. You may be asking, Mateo, what do you mean when you say good, fair, and poor? So those are the overall payment condition determined by the metrics presented in the table over here. So we report this data to the FHWA in tenths of a mile, and each one of those tenths of a mile has an associated value of international roughness index, inches per mile, a cracking percentage, and either a rotting, or a faulting value depending on if it is flexible or rigid. So depending on the values for those three metrics, we can determine the condition. For example, if the IRI is less than 95, that's going to be classified as good. If it is between 95 and 170, that section is going to be considered as fair. And if the IRI is greater than 170, it's going to be considered as poor. So to determine the overall payment condition rating, we have to take a look at those three metrics. If all three of them are good, then the final rating is going to be good. If two of them are poor, then the final rating is going to be poor. And all the other combinations are going to yield a fair crack rating. And just like the FHWA has a list of roadways that the DOT has to report interstate every year and non-interstate every two years, the state has its own highway system, and we refer to this one as the state highway system. And this data is reported to the districts every single year. As you can see on the bullets on the left-hand side, this system consists of about 12,000 centerline miles. And some of these roadways are tested in both directions. That's why the tested miles are over 20,000. And if you multiply this by the number of lanes, the total lane miles are going to be over 45,000. And just like the FHWA has set those performance goals, the state has a long-standing commitment to ensure that at least 80% of the payments on the SHS may meet the standards for non-deficient. You may be asking, what are the standards for non-deficiency? Those are presented in this table over here. So we have the right rating, the rot rating, and the correct rating. And those are ratings that range from 0 to 10, where 10 represents a pavement in excellent condition, and 0 represents a pavement in very poor condition. Six and a half is the threshold that divides deficient from non-deficient. So the right rating is a straight correlation from the value from the inertial profiler, the IRI. In this case, if the IRI is less than 125 inches per mile, that's going to have a non-deficient rating, meaning it's greater than six and a half. But if the IRI is greater than 125 inches per mile, the right rating is going to be deficient, meaning it's going to be less than six and a half. Likewise, the rod rating, it's calculated as a strike correlation from the value from the inertial profiler. In this case, if the rod depth is less than 3 eighths of an inch, the rating is going to be non-deficient. But if the rotting is deeper than 3 eighths of an inch, then that's going to be a deficient rating. And those two, the right rating and the rod rating, they are coming from the inertial profiler, meaning they are automated, whereas the crack rating is a still a manual process, and I'm going to explain in details how that crack rating is calculated on future slides. But just like the FHWA has guidance to determine the overall payment condition, the um, department has established those conditions you can see on the bullets. So if all three ratings are greater than eight and a half, that section is going to be considered in excellent condition. If all three ratings are between 6.5 and, and 8.4, that's going to be considered a section in good condition. And if one of the ratings is below 6.4, that section is going to be considered in fair condition. 
And if one of them is below 4.4, the section is going to be considered in poor condition. And something that is worth mentioning here is that the sections um, for PCS or for the state are between half a mile all the way to 25 miles. So they are different from the sections that we report to the FHWA that are in tenth of a mile. Now, if you focus your attention on this plot over here, you can see that the department has not had any issue meeting that 80% target goal for the last 15 years. And as a matter of fact, if you take a look at the 2014 value, the percentage meeting FDOT standards was close to 95%. That's why the department started prioritizing capacity projects, meaning adding lanes rather than resurfacing projects. And that's why you can see a trend going downwards. But the department is now prioritizing back resurfacing projects. I also wanted to show you this map over here that depicts the state highway system in a green line and the national highway system in a blue line. But mainly, I wanted to point your attention to the red line that represents the overlap between the state highway system and the national highway system. And as you can see, there is a lot of red in this map, meaning that there is a lot of overlap between those two systems. So we have seen why it's important to collect this data. We're all taxpayers, and we want this money to be well spent. And the way that the state and the feds can ensure that this money is well is spent is by setting those performance goals, performance targets, and ensuring that each state is meeting the standards or coming up with plans to improve if they are below the standards. So this is tied directly into asset management and the return of interest from, those, from the taxpayers' money. So now we can take a look at the way that the DOT has been collecting and reporting the cracking data since 1976, and that's using the windshield survey method. So for this section of the presentation, I would like you to put your pavement radar hat on, and this is what your point of view is going to look like. Like I said before, the crack rating is still a manual method, but the operators also have to collect the ride rating and the route rating using a profiler. So you're going to have to set up a run on your computer. You're going to have to use the keyword to mark events like beginning and end of bridges or construction zones. You're probably going to have to follow directions as to where to go, what road where you're going to test. And it's called the windshield survey because you're going to have to look through the windshield as you're driving, and you're going to try to estimate what is the condition of the pavement. So the first thing that you have to do is identify the wheel pad, which I have depicted by those shaded areas over here. This is what will be a top view of a typical lane. And if you don't know what the wheel pads are, imagine if you were to cover the tires of your vehicle with paint. And as you're driving through a section, the track marks that your vehicle will leave will certain with because vehicles wander if is what we consider as the wheel pad. And of course, anything that's not considered the wheel pad is what we refer to as outside the wheel pad. So you as an operator are going to have to estimate what is the cracking percent inside the wheel pad and outside the wheel pad. And besides that, you're going to have to estimate what is the predominant cracking severity. And by severity, I mean the width of those cracks. For example, if the crack width is less than an eighth of an inch, that's considered a class one cracking. If the crack width is between an eighth of an inch and a quarter of an inch, that's considered a class two cracking. And if the crack width is greater than a quarter of an inch, that's considered a class three cracking. And something very important is that any area that has raveling or patching counts towards that class three cracking. I'm going to say it again because this is very important. Any area that has raveling or patching counts towards that class three cracking percent. So to make this a little bit simpler, let's put an example. Let's say that after we survey a section, we estimate that there is 15% cracking inside the wheel pad and 3% cracking outside the wheel pad. And for the sake of the example, we're going to assume that the predominant class cracking is class 3. So 15% cracking inside the wheel pad is going to fall in this range over here between 6 to 25. And then predominant class 3 is going to yield a deduct of 2.5. And then we repeat the exercise for outside the wheel pad. 3% cracking is going to fall in this category, 0 to 5%, and the class 3 is going to yield a deduct of 0. Now, the crack rating is going to be 10, which is the perfect crack rating, minus your deducts. In this case, 10 minus 2.5 minus 0, it's going to yield a crack rating of 7.5. And, and remember, 6.5 is what um, 
separates the fission from non-diffusion. So now that you know how to rate a pavement section, what would you rate this section as? So as you can see, if you're driving through one of those beautiful Florida roadways with trees on both sides, those shadows make make really complicated to determine if they're really cracks in here or not. And even when you have an open landscape, detecting those cracks that are in some cases, remember we're talking about class one that's thinner than an eighth of an inch, it's probably really difficult to see. I don't know if you can see the cracks that are on this image, but I have presented the crack detection from an automated vehicle so that you can see the amount of cracking that is present here, but more on automated crack detection on future slides. So going back to the windshield survey crack rating, this, here are some of the disadvantages of this method. It is not easy to determine the crack width and the extent of the cracking as you're driving at traffic speed. That makes the method subjective and radar dependent. The other thing is that we have to assign a representative crack rating to an entire section. And like I said before, those sections may range between half a mile all the way to 25 miles. And if you only have a couple of miles with cracking, assigning a representative crack rating to the entire section may be really challenging. The other issue, if you point your attention to this little chart that I put over here, those are the ranges that we use to determine the deducts. Those ranges are really wide. So if you imagine a section with 6% cracking, for example, and to compare that to a section with 25% cracking, those sections are going to look totally different, but yet they're gonna get the same crack rating. And then the other issue with these ranges being too wide is that an operator may go to the section the first year and see 6% cracking, then 10% cracking the next year, then 15% cracking the next year, and then 20% cracking the next year. And if you have noticed, the cracking percentage has been increasing, but because it's still falling within the same range, then the crack rating is going to plateau for several years, and that is not ideal for performance modeling. And then the other drawback is that this method is not accepted for HPMS reporting by FHWA. So the department has put in place several measures to minimize subjectivity. One of them is the radar annual verification training that happens every year before we start the survey. We all get together and we visit a few sections nearby and we all try to agree in what the crack rating will be for those sections. There is also a data quality management plan, which is mandated by the FHWA, in which we specify the checks that have to be done on a daily basis, and that includes checking your tire pressure, your bounce tests, your accelerometer cal. We also have checks that have to be performed on a monthly basis, and that includes one rigid and three flexible sections where we have performed a walking survey, so we know exactly what the cracking percent is. We also have uh, the smoothness data from a type one surplus device, so we know what the IRI is, and we have also measured the rotting with a high precision device, so we know what the rotting is. And all the operators, before they hit the road and collect data, have to survey the section and report values that are within certain thresholds. Also, the operators have access to the historical ratings in the field before they start collecting data. They can see what the rating was last year, and this could be good and bad. Good because that ensures continuity on the ratings. So if the rating was six last year, then you may expect this year's rating to be in the ballpark, maybe a five or something closer. But that could also be bad because it may bias the operator before he hits the road. He may see a deficient rating and he may be expecting to see a lot of cracking. And if he doesn't see, he may think that his eyes are playing tricks on him or maybe the previous rater saw some things that he are not seeing now. Um, also, this data is reported to the district engineers, and they have 45 days to review those ratings and to come up with any potential rating discrepancies that are resolved by this office. So now that we have seen the way that the DOT has been doing business for the last several years, we can take a look at an alternative to report the cracking data that is provided by the data survey vehicles, also known as LCMS. And although we refer to this entire vehicle as the LCMS, the LCMS or laser crack measurement system is actually the set of sensors that are mounted in the back of this truck. And they are a combination of high speed cameras and high precision lasers that can detect, measure and analyze the cracks automatically. So here is the 
projection of those laser beams, the resolutions, the resolution on the transfer direction of this equipment is one millimeter. So that's about 4,160 points across the lane. And the resolution in the longitudinal direction or on the travel direction is two millimeters. That's what the department has set it up as, but can go up to one millimeter. This data survey vehicle is also equipped with an inertia profiler. So this is the one that is used to report the ride rating to determine the IRI, International Roughness Index. It also has a couple of angle lasers that are used to determine the cross loop. The DOT LCMSs have a forward camera mounted on top. This takes pictures that resembles the point of view of the driver. And the ARA LCMSs have fancier cameras. We refer to these ones as the ladybug cameras. And these ones take panoramic pictures, 360 degree images that resembles the one that you may have seen on um, Google Street View. Also, there are a couple of GPS antennas that have submeter accuracy that allows you to know exactly um, where this vehicle is at at all moments. And the beauty of this equipment is that now we can report all the distresses at any given interval. We can report 10 to a mile data to FHWA. We can report section level to our PCS program. We can go and report the construction limits, or we can even go finer to thousands of a mile or even image by image reports. And here is an example of how the automated crack detection looks like. Uh, the equipment also detects the lane markings. You can see they are represented by those dark blue lines and the wheel pads that are represented by the light blue lines. And this is how the automated crack detection will look like. And I'm not going to get into a lot of details of how those algorithms works, but if this is a topic that you're interested in, there is an ARA webinar next month in where Brian Moon is going to go into full details about how those algorithms works. But what I can tell you is that this system uses the pixel values from the images and the heights from the lasers and the amount of light reflected to the sensors to determine that 3D profile of the roadway and it will identify those discontinuities and automatically detect the cracking using machine learning algorithms. So we can report the cracking for the wheel pad and outside the wheel pad to be consistent with the F dot protocol. We can also report route depth from the LCMS because it meets the requirements established on ASHTO R87, which is the standard required by FHWA for HPMS reporting. We can also report faulting from this equipment because it meets the standards of ASHTO R36. And even though the vendor, in this case, paid metrics are the manufacturer of the LCMS sensors and ICC, International Cybernetics, is the company that assembles these vehicles together. Even though they provide an algorithm to detect raveling, the results were not matching the historical data of the department. And that's why EFTA decided to contract Georgia Tech to come up with a recommendation as to how to detect raveling from the LCMS images. And the recommendation from Dr. Sai and his group was to use machine learning technology, artificial intelligence, which seems to be everybody's favorite buzzword these days. Um, but jokes aside, the way that this technology works is we had our most experienced raters classifying over a thousand images. They had to classify these images into one of four categories, either non, low, moderate, or severe raveling. So that constituted the training data set. And that tra training data set was used to come up with a model using the random forest technique. And if you don't know what random forest is, you may know what a decision tree is. And what do you call an area with a lot of trees? A forest. So that's where the random forest concept comes from. It's a lot of decision trees that are used to make a determination. So that's the model, we build the model, and now what we can do with this model is we can feed this model new images, and those images are going to be broken down into smaller pieces. Some statistics are going to be calculated, like the average pixel value, the standard deviation, root mean square, kurtosis, skewness, and interquart high range. So those statistics are going to be fit, are going to be fed to the model, and then the output of this model is going to be the category of the routing for that specific image. And I have put a couple of examples in this slide where you can see that the actual severity, which is the severity determined by the experience raters, matches what the model gave us. 
in both cases, uh, medium and severe rattling. So now we can uh, report rattling at any given interval. Each one of those LCMS images is about 20 feet long, but we can also summarize this data in tenth of a mile or section level. We can identify those areas easily. And although EFTA does not do any surface treatments such as slurry seals or chip seals, they do what they refer to as the FC5 only candidates. And FC5 is a type of open graded mixture that looks like the one that I have depicted on this picture. And as you can see, it has a lot of voids and those voids are actually good for drainage, draining the water while it's raining and reducing the spray during rainy conditions. But those boys can also make this type of mixture prone to rattling. If you combine the effect of rattling with the effect of the weather, those aggregates may start to be dislodged and that's what causes rattling. So we can now identify those potential candidates for FC5 only easier. And if you remember something that I repeated when I was explaining the windshield survey, any area that has rattling counts towards the highest severity cracking percent. So that's why identifying rallying was really important for us. So now we're ready to dive into the estimation of the crack rating models. And the objective was to use the outputs from the LCMS, meaning the cracking percentage both in and out of the wheel pad and the rattling percentage, and to come up with a model, which in this case is represented by this funnel, whose output will be the LCMS crack rating. And this LCMS crack rating had to be comparable to the windshield survey crack rating. And we also wanted to achieve what was defined as a soft landing, a smooth transition. That was defined as having about the same number of failing miles. For example, if we told the district last year you had 1,000 miles failing with the windshield survey, we cannot come this year and tell them you're failing 5,000 miles because they're going to come to us and tell us how come we're failing five times as many miles as we were before. So we wanted to provide about the same number of failing miles. And we also wanted to have a highest percentage of matching failing miles. In other words, if we told the districts last year you're failing US 27, I-95, and US 1, hopefully this year we're going to tell them they are failing the same roadways are not totally different ones. And we also wanted a model that was easy to explain and to apply. And one of the first challenges that we faced when we started looking at this data was what I have depicted on this plot. I plotted the LCMS cracking percent in the wheel pad on the x-axis. That's what the vehicle detected as cracking against the windshield survey crack rating, and this is what the operator classified this section as. So to make my point, I would like you to focus your attention on this rating, for example. So this is a section that has a crack rating of three and a half with 0% cracking, but this section also has a crack rating of 3.5 with 10% cracking, and then this section also has a rating of 3.5 with 20% cracking, and I think you get the point. What's going on is that there is a widespread distribution of cracking, and if we try to feed a model, we will end up with a really low R-square and um, a lot of outliers. So. We know this was going to be a challenge, but if you take a look at the header of this presentation, this is what we do at ARA. We come up with innovative solutions to complex problems. So we took a look at what some other states have done, and we saw that some of them had had luck with a linear model. So we started experiencing with a linear model. Wanted to somehow cap capture the same philosophy of the windshield survey by having the three different cracking severities. And that's why if you take a look at the equation of that linear model, we have nine different terms. The first three are the ones that represent the cracking in the wheel pad, cracking in the wheel pad class one, two, and three. The second three terms are the ones that represent the cracking outside the wheel pad, same thing, uh, class one, two, and three. And the last three terms are the ones associated with the rattling severities, low, moderate, and severe. And rather than just feeding this data to a software and having like Python or um, any statistical package giving us those coefficients. What we did is we fixed the coefficient for class one and we assigned weights to the other coefficients. We took a look at the relationship between those deducts and you can see when it goes from class one to class two, it's almost double or about one and a half times. So we assigned weights to the other cracking coefficients. And for the rallying coefficients, what we did is 
We asked our most experienced traders, if you have a section with a 100% low severity rate traveling, what would the rating be for that section? They agree that will be a nine out of a 10. If the section is 100% covered by modest severity rallying, that will be a 6.25. It's a section that is borderline failing. Remember, six and a half is what divides deficient from non-deficient. And then if the section is 100% covered by severe rallying, that will yield a crack rating of three. So that's how we back calculated those coefficients for the rallying terms. And on the next slide, I'm going to show you a plot that compares the outputs from the linear model, which are going to be those green dots that you will see against the operator strike rating or the windshield survey strike ratings. And those are going to look like lines, but they are a group of points because they are grouped by the sections that have the same rating. They're also going to look like steps because these are sorted by largest to smallest. So once again, this will be all the sections where the operator rated the pavement as a 10. There's about 2,500 sections uh, with a rating of 10. And then the green dots are going to represent the output from that linear model. And if you remember the goals that we have to achieve that soft landing, we wanted to have about the same number of failing miles, in this case with the windshield survey. And with the LCMS, we're failing about the same number of failing miles. We're only six miles over the target value. That represents a really low percent difference. And also the number of matching failing lane miles is high. We have about 3,000 miles out of 4,000, which represents about 76%. In other words, three out of four sections that were failing with the previous method are failing with the new method. So that was looking good. That was checking all the boxes. But if you take a look at the coefficient of correlation that R squared, it will be a one if there was a perfect match between the windshield survey and the LCMS ratings, but we knew that that was impossible. So we were not aiming for a R square of one, but we wanted to have a higher coefficient of correlation. And then the other metric that we evaluated was the root mean square error. And that is um, computed by calculating the difference between the observed value and the predicted value. You square that difference, then you take the average of those differences, and then you take the root square of those mean differences. That's how it, that's why it's called root mean square error. And what the experts have agreed is that an acceptable value will be about 10% of your range. In our case, our range is from zero to 10, and 10% will be a root mean square error of about one. So you can see this one is even closer to 20%. So, we started to look at the root mean square error for each one of those group of sections. And what you can see is that the error is low up to a certain point, and then it spikes. So in other words, there was good agreement between the linear equation and the windshield survey ratings up to a certain point. But after that, the PCS ratings or the windshield ratings kind of flatten out where the linear ratings were failing to dramatically. And you can see the distribution of the ratings. They were kind of following the same trend, but we ended up with a lot more uh, sections with a zero rating than what the uh, PCS windshield survey rating was estimating. So this trend kind of gave us a hint that we maybe had to look at an exponential model instead. And that's what we did next. We look at an exponential model, but we also look at the historical dedux for the wheel pattern outside the wheel path for the last three years. We removed the sections with patching from the data set because patching is not something that the equipment detects, the LCMS detects. There are a couple of papers that are even looking into combining the results from the profiler with the LCMS to detect patching. But so far, there is not a well-established procedure to determine patching. That's why we removed all the sections with patching. We also removed sections that were dense graded where the operator had flag raveling. First, because Raveling is a defect that affects mostly open graded friction courses. And second, because that random forest um, machine learning model was developed using only open graded friction courses images. So we generated image by image reports and we removed bridges because the joints on those bridges are going to be detected as cracks. We also remove under construction areas because sometimes what happens is that when they remove the lane markings that's probably going to be detected as cracking, or if they mill the surface, they, that may look as a gravel surface. 
And like I said, we generated image by image report, but we summarized this data over the section length that could be anywhere from half a mile all the way to 25 miles. And we developed data equations for the wheel pad and outside of the wheel pad. And also we split the models into a model for open graded and ones for dense graded. So this is how the trend for the historical DDoX looks like. You can see uh, it has an exponential trend. And the way you can interpret these plots is by saying that about 100% of the lane miles had a DDoX in the wheel pad of zero or more. About 60% of the lane miles had a DDoX in the wheel pad of one or more. About 40% of the lane miles had a DDoX in the wheel pad of two or more, and so on and so forth. So we wanted to match this exponential trend from the windshield survey DDoX to the LCMS DDoX. And this is how the exponential model looks like. Like I said before, we split the model into a model for open graded and one model for dense graded. And the difference, the main difference is that the open graded has this rallying deduct. Um, you can see the equations that they follow an exponential trend. We have a couple of coefficients, A and B. You can see the values for those over here. And we also have a couple of inputs to this model, X1, that represents the cracking percent inside the wheel pad or outside the wheel pad for the CL deduct. And then we also have another input, which is X2, in this case is the crack width. And if you compare this model to the linear model, you may notice that on the linear model, we were using the three different cl cracking classes, class one, two, and three. But the way we are addressing the cracking severity on these models is by including the crack width directly into the model. And you can see the results. The LCMS DDoX um, are matching pretty well the curve for the historical DDoX from PCS. And the same is true for the crack ratings. They follow the same exponential trend. If you take a look at the error between the LCMS and the PCS crack rating, you can see that this is normally distributed, meaning that the majority of errors are low. And this is how that exponential model looks like. If you were to compare this image to the linear model, you can see that there is a lot less points on this side and on this side. And we also wanted to see how many of those yellow points that represents the outputs from the exponential model were within 1.5 points of the DDoX. So that's why you see those bands over there. And we have about 88% of those yellow points between the bands. Now, we're also able to meet the goals of the soft landing. We have about the same number of failing miles. We're only 32 lane miles short, which that could be very well be one section. Um, and in terms of the matching lane miles, we are still at 75%, meaning that we're still failing three out of four sections that were failing before with the previous method. And the R square looks a lot better. We knew that we were not going to get an R square of one, but at least the root mean square error is looking pretty good. It's um, close to what the statistician accepts as an acceptable value. And we're still having some outliers. As you can see over here, those are the sections where the operator classified the section as a 10. But the LCMS is seeing some cracking because the rating is lower. And what we have seen um, is that most of the false cracking detection cases fall within one of those three options. We have rim scarring. If you don't know what that is, that usually happens when a semi or a big truck blows its tire. So that tire is not going to have any more rubber. It's going to be just the naked rim. And as the vehicle continues to drive along the roadway, that rim is going to start scarring the pavement. It's going to leave that scar. That's going to look like a crack, but that's actually not a distress. Now, there is a big no for the LCMSs, and we cannot run them if the pavement is wet or if even if there is any moisture in the sensors, that's gonna look like a dark stripe with a lot of cracking. And then we also have a lot of these brick crosswalks in Florida and the covers of the manholes are also detected as cracking. That's a detection, the automated crack detection of the equipment. But the way we are addressing this situation is by adding cracking invalidation events here and here. And what those cracking invalidation events are going to do is they're gonna tell the system ignore the cracking that is in between those two events. And like I said before, this is a still an ongoing process. We have a few next steps. We're going to continue cleaning up those outliers. 
We estimate that we are going to end up with about 15% outliers, and if we collect 20,000 miles, that represents about 3,000 miles. And the productivity for an experience rating is about three miles an hour, but for a rookie, it could be like a mile an hour. So if we go with the conservative value, um, you would require 3,000 hours to review all those outliers, which is more hours than you work in a year. So our management is trying to hire one or two people to help us cleaning up those outliers um, all year round. We're also documenting the step-by-step -step process to have a clear game plan next year. And we're also sharing this information with smart people like you for feedback. Next thing we're gonna do is we're going to feed the forecasting models with 10 to 4 mile data to determine the impact of the um, finer interval resolution data. And here is actually an example of the use of the 10 to 4 mile data. This is an actual special request that we received from a district engineer. And what you can see over here is on the x-axis, we have the milepost. So if you were driving down this road, you will go in this direction. And this plot has a couple of sections. The bottom part of this plot presents the LCMS crack rating calculated with the exponential model. And the upper part of this plot presents the LCMS cracking percentage. The dark blue line, it's the cracking for this year. And the gray line is the cracking for the previous year. So you can see that the equipment is pretty repeatable. Now, what I wanted to show you on this slide is that, remember that I told you that a PCS section could be anywhere between half a mile to 25 miles. In this case, the PCS section was from milepost three to about milepost 18. And the whole section had one crack rating. But if you take a look at the cracking percentage, up to milepost 10, the cracking percent is below 5% for the most part, except this isolated area over here. But then after milepost 10, the cracking spikes, and this section could have been broken down differently. Maybe add a break and have a higher crack rating for this section and a lower crack rating for this section. And also, the district engineer was going to resurface this section between those breaks, and what we pointed out was that some of the areas before and after those resurfacing breaks may require some uh, rehabilitation as well. We're also going to build QC tools, and mainly those are going to be SQL tables that compare the LCMS ratings for the actual for the current year to the previous year, and we're going to determine those outliers and what to do with them. And we're also building data visualization tools, and since I have still a couple of minutes on my presentation. I would like to show you a data visualization tool that I built using Power BI. Um, and what this does is this allows us to, short, to share the images collected with the LCMS with any of the eight districts in Florida. So the way this works is you can come here and select your district, and then you're gonna see the list of roadways that belong to that district. If you know your roadway ID, you can come here and type it and it's gonna ask you if you wanna see the down station or the up station direction, so you can select. And this is going to display um, the actual cracking percentage or here. Reset this, so you will see the forward uh, images collected with forward camera. You will see the location of this roadway on a map and you will see the LCMS images. And if you remember on that slide that I showed you that had an isolated issue, over here, if you wanted to inspect what's going on with that specific area, you can click on that dot, and that's going to take you to that image and you can see what's going on. This is a section that's been riled off. And if you want to inspect that area further, you can type in the milepost. For example, if we wanna inspect what's going on between 5.5 and 6, you can use this navigation tool to go through the images so you will kind of simulate that windshield survey. The department was pretty happy with this tool because a vendor was trying to sell this for a couple of $10,000 a year. And also this reduces the amount of windshield surveys and even walking surveys that have to be performed. Now an engineer can look at a section being on Scambia County, which is in the limits with Alabama. Um, he can take a look at a section that's probably down in the Florida Keys that's 12 hours apart without having to leave the office. So. We don't have to do those walking surveys that are pretty dangerous, that's pretty good. And actually, 
Uh, unfortunately, one of our ARA colleagues was injured while he was performing one of these walking surveys. So I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to salute Manan Patel. I hope that you are recording quickly. I also wanted to give special thanks to the FDOT folks that have been instrumental in this process, Charles, Jamie, Thad, Noah, Hank, and Kyle. Thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it back to Sri for some additional information on the upcoming webinars, and we will come back to the Q&A sections in a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Mateo. That was a very fascinating presentation and a lot of good work you've done uh, with that thought. Uh, I was really impressed. Um, for those who are attending the webinar, you may now begin submitting your questions in the Q&A pod and Mateo will answer as many questions as possible in the time remaining. Uh, make sure that when you enter a question in the Q&A pod, um, you're pretty clear about what you're trying to ask uh, because sometimes it's a little bit difficult to interpret um, what your intentions are. So uh, we hope you enjoyed uh, today's webinar. Um, we, uh, we hope you will join us for future webinars on October 25th, 2023, Dr. Brian Moon will present um, somewhat a related topic to today's webinar, AI application on pavement track det detection uh, using UAVs. So uh, it's a, a brand new exciting uh, field uh, that uh, Brian has worked quite a bit on and he will present on that topic. On November 29th, uh, Zafu Khan uh, will present evaluation of pavement performance and condition using numerical simulation. Um, so uh, two very related topics and very exciting uh, coming up in October and November and hope you can join us for those two webinars. Uh, we have many more exciting topics and area presenters in the works for 2024. Uh, so please watch your email for updates or visit the Webinar Wednesday webpage, uh, www.ara.com uh, backslash webinars. So I'm going to uh, get, get started into the Q&A portion. Uh, and Matteo, again, uh, we'll try to cover as many as we can, but uh, there's a lot of Q&A, so we may not be able to get to uh, all of those. So um, uh, first question is, um, are you aware of any international or ASTO standards for automatic crack detection? Well, I know there is an ASCM standard that is related to um, crack detection, so I don't remember exactly what the standard number is, but I can dig into my paper where and share that. If the person interested can send me an email, I can take a look and uh, I can share that with them. So here's a question. I, I believe you may have somewhat addressed this, but uh, let me ask again. Um, did you develop your own algorithms for crack detection and severity using the LCMS or did you use uh, the vendor's uh, algorithms? No, we're using the vendor algorithms for the cracking detection, but we, develop or the FDOT develop in-house an algorithm to detect raveling. So remember, the raveling is also important for us because it's part of the cracking raising. So the cracking was coming from the algorithm from the vendor, but raveling was using that machine learning algorithm, random forest. So that was developed in-house using the recommendations from the Georgia Tech team from Dr. Sai. Okay. Um, and uh, for clarification, did you use LCMS-1 or LCMS-2? This is LCMS-2 sensors. Um, there's a question with uh, QAQC. Um, do you manually QAQC LCMS crack detection or is the QAQC 100% automatic? Yes, so um, the QC, like I said before, we have the data quality management plan where we specify um, what they have to do on a monthly basis that includes riding through the rigid section and the flexible section. And on those sections, we have done walking surveys. So vehicles get verified every month. But as part of the DQMP, we have to also manually review 5% of the collected images. And we are kind of verifying the crack detection of the equipment. We're making sure that the detected cracks are really there. And if are missing some cracks, we will draw them, and if those are false positives, we'll delete them, and we will compare the cracking percentages before and after, and if they are within 20%, that is considered acceptable. All right, thank you, Mateo. 
Um, there's a question on road markings. Can you address uh, any road markings, uh, cracks, and how to uh, remove them, or if you if you have any experience with those? Well, I guess for crack markings, you gotta use a different type of laser, which is the one that is on the MRU unit, on the mobile retroactivity unit, and I don't think this uh, type of lasers have the same capabilities, so I wouldn't think that you can use to report the thing as millicandela's values that are reported with an MRU unit, so I don't think you can use it for um, lane striping. So the equipment automatically detects the lane markings, but it doesn't have the capability to report values um, for the MRU program. Um, so there's a question on um, discrepancies in distress ratings. Um, how did the department effectively address uh, discrepancies in distress ratings reported to the uh, district? So are there any protocols or mechanisms put in place to resolve uh, these discrepancies? Absolutely. I can tell you about what it was done before the LCMS era. Um, if there was a section where the district engineer didn't agree with the rating, then what will happen is that they will contact this office and then this office will send an engineer and an experience rater to take a second look at that section and try to agree on what the rating will be for that section. So you can quantify how expensive that will be to send an engineer and a rater again. If, say, for example, that section is down in Miami, which is six <coughs> hours away from here, they'll have to use spend one day driving, staying there, and then do this survey the next year. So that represents a lot of money. Now with the tools that we have, for example, with the SMS image viewer, they can do the windshield survey from the comfort of their offices, and they can you know, arise any potential discrepancies that can be resolved with this office. Um, I, I think you may have addressed this, but there's a question on can we measure 3D sensor rut depth and rut width um, using the LCMS? Absolutely, yeah. It can be reported to FHWA because it meets the standards of H2 R36, and we have compared that to the results from the um, from bumper from the laser profiler, and they are pretty close. There are some values that are reported higher than the profiler and lower than the profiler. So we've done a quick study where we saw the impact of transitioning from the 3D, um, yeah, from the profiler to the 3D system, and there is not going to be um, much of an impact on transitioning, so that's also expected to, for FHWA, is, is going to be reported for sure, but for the PCS program, it's uh, also intended in a few years. And so, uh, this, uh, the same person asked a related question. What about mean profile depth, uh, mean texture depth? Uh, can you measure those with the LCMS sensors? Well, you can. You can actually report those values. You can report MTD, mean texture value, mean profile depth, MPD. You can report RMS, root mean square, um, and actually Dr. Young Lee from ARA is looking into the use of those metrics to compare them to the values reported from a friction truck. So I wouldn't go as far as saying that a LCMS would replace a friction truck um, to measure those texture values, but at least there can be a correlation from the reported values from the 3D system. Okay, um, here's another um, question. Uh, at what mile intervals you're not, um, you analyze the tracking data and give the area rating? Sure. Um, for FHWA, we report the data at a tenth of a mile interval. And the cracking that we report to them is a little bit different because they only care about the cracking in the wheel path. And for the pavement condition system program for the PCS, we report the data at the section level. So those sections could be anywhere from half a mile all the way to 25 miles. And those sections are supposed to have similar conditions like same levels of traffic of, or um, same surface textures, um, same number of lanes. So those are supposed to be homogeneous sections. But sometimes they differ in terms of the cracking percentages and that's what happened on one of those examples that I show that the whole section was 15 miles long from 3 to 18, but actually um, the first seven miles didn't have much cracking and the remaining part of the section did have a lot of cracking. So. Uh, there's another question, but I'm going to answer that question. <laughs> there's a question okay. that says, 
how effective is the use of drones for payment distress identification and evaluation? Uh, there's a question, and I'm going to say, uh, please attend uh, next month's webinar because uh, that's going to be on uh, UAV. So Brian Moon is going to talk about that. So, uh, uh, so the, the uh, person who asked that question, please uh, make sure you attend uh, next month's webinar on uh, UAVs for uh, distress identification and evaluation. Um, there is another question: Is the traffic factor considered as a variable for the model? Uh, and, I, and I'm going to kind of tie that in with uh, another question that says. Are there any ongoing efforts and considerations to incorporate a broader spectrum of influencing factors, environment, traffic patterns, material properties, et cetera? Well, I think the material part, the material properties are included in the model by splitting them by open graded and dense graded. So we have two different models. I think that's the way we're taking care of the material properties part. In terms of the traffic and the weather, we haven't looked into those yet. But I have seen that, for example, payment age may be another factor that uh, we can bring into the model. This morning we had a discussion of having a deduct for patching. Uh, maybe we're going to manually draw the areas with patching and uh, with even pumping and then have separate terms added to that equation. But um, yeah, so far that's where we are. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another comment or question. Um, LCMS2 many times fails in rigid payment as it detects expansion joints and transfer clues as a crack in LCMS images. Do um, you have any thoughts on how to deal and report it or anything that has been done? I can't agree more 100% on that side. Actually, our rigid sections are manually reviewed. We don't report the cracking percent from the LCMS. What we do is we look at the images, but every rigid section in Florida has to be manually reviewed. So we agree that the uh, detection on rigid payments is not the best, and that's why we're still using kind of like semi-automated uh, process because we're using the images, and we also have a process that can bring the previous year distresses into the current year to avoid having to draw all the distresses. But like I said before, this is still a semi-automated process. It's not a full automated process. Um, thank you, Mateo. I think we can end the Q&A session at this point in time. We're almost out of time. Um, we have a few more minutes, and if we did not get to your question, uh, Mateo has agreed to answer questions for the next 24 hours via email. Uh, we just ask that you please make sure your questions are not consulting questions, and please understand that there may be F dot uh, proprietary sensitivities around the topic that may limit his ability to respond to your question. Um, and his email is uh, shown on the slide, uh, M-C-A-R-V-A-J-A-L, uh, mcarvajal at ARA.com. On behalf of ARA, uh, thank you for joining us today. Today's presentation is being recorded, and a link will be made available on the ARA Webinar Wednesday website uh, sometime next week. We will also send a PDA certificate to all participants verified by our attendance report as pre present for the full hour of the webinar. A copy of today's presentation will also be included, so please allow at least three weeks to receive your certificate. ARA is a great company to work for, and we were recently named one of the top 200 federal contractors in the Bloomberg Government Report. Uh, ARA is also unique in that it's 100% employee-owned. Uh, we continue to grow dynamically and are always looking for more great people to join our team. If you're interested in employment opportunities within ARA's transportation and infrastructure offices, uh, please send a brief resume and contact information to www.joinara at ara.com. That's webinar Wednesday, joinara at ara.com. Um, thank you for joining today, and we hope you will join us on October 25th for our next webinar Wednesday, AI application on payment track detection using UAV by Dr. Brian Yoon. Uh, I know at least one person who asked a question is going to be joining us for that webinar. So uh, thank you for joining, and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.